Huawei has announced the Mate 9, top of the line, with a whopping 5.9-inch 1080p display and runs on the Kirin 960 with 4GB of RAM and 64GB of storage plus microSD. Wow, top of the line specs then with a 4000 mAh sealed battery and USB Type-C for Huawei's proprietary fast charging standard. As usual with Huawei, the fingerprint scanner is on the back, plus there's a refreshed version of the P9's dual camera system, which I didn't think worked that well, but hey, I'll test it. The Mate 9 will come with Android 7 and EMUI 5.0 on top and will be available in Europe to fill which is essentially a Galaxy Note 7 sized hole in the market, though apparently not to the UK where I live. Eh? What? Also looking a lot like a Galaxy Note 7 is the Xiaomi Mi Note 2 with a 5.7 inch curved display, a Snapdragon 821 chipset and up to a massive 6 gigabytes of RAM and 128 gigabytes of storage. There's a typical 22 megapixel rear camera though with no OIS plus 8 megapixel on the front. NFC's here for Android Pay, something you don't always get on Chinese phones, plus a 40-70 mAh battery with quick charge 3.0. As ever, you have to kind of buy direct from Xiaomi and get it shipped across the world, but hey, it might be worth it. Anyone remember the Wiley Fox Swift from last year? So many people following our podcast snapped that up and loved it. Now there's a Swift too, albeit a few tens of pounds more. But you do get a fingerprint sensor and NFC with Android Pay and phase detection autofocus in the camera and it's now metal build and you get quick charge 3.0 and USB Type-C. And for speaker buffs like me, there's a big speaker hidden in the bottom, I'm promised. All this for just over £150, including VAT, in the UK. I'm really impressed, and I'm getting one in for review as soon as possible. I think I've used a fair number of phones in my time, and well over half running Android, if you're counting. So there it was I listening to one of my favourite podcasts from Android Central, where the guys are very knowledgeable, and they were waxing lyrical over the latest Huawei Mate 9, as featured in the news just now talking about the much faster Kirin chipset with an extra 0.1 gigahertz per core and a much better GPU. But the thing is, and I love the guys on the podcast, don't get me wrong, they were indicating that these chipset differences were enough to sway a buying decision, i.e. last year's Mate 8 was now old hat and the only one worth considering was the new one. And we see analysis like this all the time in the phone world with table after table of benchmark scores pointing out that the Galaxy S7 is twice as fast as the Google Nexus 5X, for example. Twice! And I'm absolutely sure that if you were enamoured of the most resource-hungry games in the phone world, you might see a difference. A very slight difference. The rest of the time, you, me and Joe Average user will notice no difference at all once other factors have been allowed for. My contention here is that the actual chipset and GPU used in any phone makes surprisingly little difference and you can almost discount them within reason. The Snapdragon series of chips is by far the best known overall in the phone world, so let's mention this. The Snapdragon 650 and 652 are mid-range chipsets, right? You know that from the 6-bit at the start, rather than the 8 that starts all the flagship chipsets. Yet in all testing, the Snapdragon 650 range were just as quick as last year's 810 flagship chipset. On the Phone Show Chat podcast, Ted and I were chatting about phones coming out with the, quote, low-end Snapdragon 430 chipset. Yet this is substantially more capable than the Snapdragon 800 powerhouse that debuted with the classic Nexus 5, which still runs extremely well today. Who'd have thought it? Speed may indeed be your thing when it comes to smartphones, the fluidity of the interface, the speed at which applications launch and pop back to the foreground, the speed at which web pages render and so on. And these are perfectly valid metrics. But even more important for all of these are actually the amount of RAM in the phone, how it's being used, the applications themselves, the OS skin and other modules currently running, the speed of the flash storage and so on. In other words, choosing a smartphone is a lot more complicated than just going for the one with the fastest chipset. I'd even go so far as to say that a well-optimised and stripped-down two-year-old classic, think my beloved Google Nexus 6 here, will be smoother and more usable than many a manufacturer messed with 2016 Android flagship. The OS itself does make a difference, of course. Windows Phone 8 always used to be a winning in terms of speed and fluidity on even low-end hardware, but then there was the opportunity for many to upgrade to Windows 10 Mobile, and bang, everything now takes twice as long on average. Oh well. 
while Apple have always done a terrific job optimizing their OS and current chipsets. In theory, Android powerhouses should be smoother and faster, and yet it never quite works out that way in practice. RAM is the single biggest real-world metric to look for in a new or second-hand phone. Just as on a laptop computer, the more random access memory, the more applications and their temporary data can live there, ready for instant recall. In practice, in 2016, this means you need two gigabytes minimum, whichever platform you're using, and the more, the better. Then there are special components such as screen size and quality, for example, contrast outdoors, materials, think grip and durability, speakers, the stereo, volume, fidelity, camera, and positioning of any biometrics, i.e. fingerprint sensor on the back, the side, the front. I contend that all of these factors are more important than exactly which chipset is inside a phone. Do you really truly care that the octa-core 1.5 gigahertz chip inside phone A benchmarks 30% faster than the quad-core 2 gigahertz chip inside phone B? No, I thought not. <laughs> Which is partly why in my phone reviews, I very rarely talk about chipsets and internals, about benchmarks and GPUs. They're almost entirely irrelevant for any phone newer than a couple of years. So don't get too hung up on specifications, eh? There's plenty more to get your teeth into when researching smartphones. You've probably had more than enough of my ugly mug on camera. Shall I carry this phone show into its 12th repeat 12th year? Comments welcome. Anyway, if you want more UK voiced commentary on phones, tech, music and movies, then note that Ted Salmon and I not only do the Phone Show Chat audio podcast, there's also now Chewing Gum for the Ears, a show about music and another projector room about movies and TV, each with guests to introduce their favourite. To make things super easy, just Google PodHub UK or go to tinyurl.com forward slash PodHub UK and I'll put big links to all the podcasts there. Happy listening. Oh, before I go, if you watch The Phone Show on YouTube, then please, please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and also like the various videos. And if you catch The Phone Show chat on iTunes, then please give us a, a nice five star review if you like the show. Thanks a lot.